these eyes are crying. These eyes are crying because they've seen a lot of love, but not like you. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I picked that? Why? Have you ever seen the movie Superbad? Yeah. <laughs> you know when they, they, they force the John Cena to sing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he's really awkward and stuff? <laughs> that's exactly how I feel right now. <laughs> So that's why. So, and the funny part was, you just said that no one's ever heard you sing. No, this is the, this is the but first now time. they have. This is the first time. Yeah. So that was Kieran from how do you, K Reed. K Reed. K yeah. Reed Renovations, right? K Reed Renovations. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So Carlito. Manny. We have a very interesting podcast today. I know. I'm actually pumped. I'm super excited about this one. We are going to talk a lot about plastering. Plaster, yeah. Old school. Old school traditional heritage. way of doing it. Wow. Yeah. We're going to learn a lot about plastering and we're going to go down the whole road. But before we begin with that, that Instagram handle is uh, what, Kieran? It's KR. It's either dot or underscore plaster. Or I just changed it. <laughs> you just changed it? <laughs> we'll find out um, eventually. Yeah. Uh, I, I, think think it's, it's, I think it's underscore. Yeah, I think it's KR underscore plaster. Or. My dad's got the other one. So Just oh, yeah. so you know, about 14,000 people are going to hear you sing that one song now. 14,000? <laughs> no way. It's fine. Oh, so no. yeah, you're right. It's, it's at KR underscore plaster. Or. Before we get into that. Oh, this is one of my favorite moments. <laughs> it's history with Manny. And you know what? To be very honest, I... I actually think you're going to know this, Karen. It depends. I think you're going. To, okay, <laughs> we're talking about the origin of lath and plaster. Okay. How far back does it go, and how f- or how early was it still being used? It depends where you read. I think the the Minoans were using it. You know the bull jumpers back in around about Greece. Were they really using it that far back? Yeah. Really? Yeah, they were using it. So that's before Pompeii and stuff. Pompeii was what? 3,000 years ago? No. I'm not, my, well, my research gets me, it gets me as far back as the 1700s is where it actually officially started, the lath and plaster. And they did it as... Uh, oh, la- a lath and plaster. Lath and plaster. Lath and plaster yeah. yeah, just lath Sorry. and plaster, right? Pla- yeah. But, but plastering, I guess, went further back on yeah. its own. Yeah, plasters before the Romans and... Yeah, so basically stuff. what they're saying here in, in my research was saying that lath and plaster in North America and also in the UK yeah. was 1700s to the 1940s. Yeah. Wow. Right around 1941 is when the wall boards started coming in. So the two by four wall boards and drywall started going in the 950s. A little bit earlier. I thought it was like 30s. I got a 1940s, yeah. right? So yeah. I mean, but still, that's a big chunk of time that they were doing lath and plaster, right? Yeah. Which is the old school way that you still do some of it that way yeah. with wire mesh, still right? Still do quite a lot, yeah. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of interesting. I just wanted to let you know that that, that was a little. That was yeah. history with Manny. <laughs> 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 and it goes on and on about three coats. They did it th- that typical way about uh, the lad, and they Scratch actually coat. They would yeah. actually cut all the lumber on site right then and there, and then strip them on and nail them on. And well, get that's how they used to build houses. That's how it was done. That's how it was. Yeah. Done, you know, right? most of the houses in Toronto are Douglas fir. And now yeah. there's no Douglas fir because they built all the houses. Exactly. And so all the good woods been used. And then I also wanted to bring up that this is uh, y- y- we got a special because this is our seventy fifth podcast. Wow. Is this is our 75. 75. So, um Happy I, birthday. I actually wanted to uh, <laughs> <laughs> He thinks you're 75, Manny. Yeah. You know, you're looking good. I'm, I'm not too far off. You look pretty Matt. good for 75. I'm not too far <laughs> off, but we wanted to do a little giveaway. So, it's funny enough is that we're recording this on a Tuesday, which is May 12th. But we're posting this on the Thursday of next week on the 21st. They're going to know, hey, look, it's happy birthday time for 75, right? But we have a series of questions that we're going to ask, and we have a little bit of a giveaway. Wow, man. Nice. We won't I'm say really pretty the, pumped about that. To be a winner in this contest. Giveaway, giveaway. You have to answer any three of these eight questions. And if you've been listening to the podcast, you should be able to answer any three of these eight questions. Now, is that one, two, three? One, two, three. Yes, exactly. So here are the eight questions that you get to choose any three. First one is, what is Manny's least favorite style of kitchen? Dun, da, da, what is Carlito's golden rule about construction? Dun, da, da, dun. If your kids are making you arrive on the job site late, what does Manny suggest you do with your kids? Da, da. What make and model of van does Carlito drive? Ooh. What does Manny think is the best insulated wall assembly? Hmm. According to John McLennan, what is the best way to build your construction business? I like that. What are Manny and Carlito's thoughts on reno actors? It's a two-parter there Ooh, because we know Carlito loves two-parters. That's a spooky. 
What are Carlito's key drywall steps? And I will give you a clue. There's five of them there. One, two, three, <laughs> four, <laughs> five. <laughs> so that's the 75th podcast qu- giveaway. And answer any three of those questions, and you will be a winner. First 10 winners get the prize. Let's get into Kieran. Yeah. It's, I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> I've, I've only spoken to you briefly. I've seen the work. You know, I'm a massive fan. I love what this guy does, like, and how he, and I don't know, are you the only one in? There's, um, I've got a little bit of a, I guess, an advantage or a disadvantage, depends which way you look at it. There's a lot of guys who still do plaster, but most of it's with more modern products with gypsum based plasters and stuff. A, a lot of expats. I don't know of any North American guys or girls who do it. I don't know any. Um, I haven't seen anyone in a very, very, very long time do, yeah. it, do it the old school way. When would yeah. have been the last time that you saw anybody? Probably like 20 years ago. Really? Huh? Yeah. And he would not have been a Canadian. He was from Nova Scotia. Was he? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know, I know. He was actually a Mason also. Plaster and, and masonry kind of go hand in hand. Really? Yeah. So the exterior plasterers used to be the guys who did the roofing as well. Wow. So they would do the, the roof and then they would do the exterior. Because you've done it as well too. You've gotten into doing some tongue pointing, some stone work. A little bit. A little pieces, bit of it, yeah, but you've yeah. gotten into it, right? Yeah, just, just stuff, like very small stuff that I can handle or the, the clients couldn't find anybody else or, or whatever, just to kind of help them out. I know enough about the materials to be able to to do a little bit of work, but just not, I wouldn't call myself a mason or a, no. anything like that. Everyone will not- may have noticed that Kieran's got a little bit of an accent. He does? <laughs> to who? <laughs> <laughs> to people who don't know anybody you else. Know, if you know, if you go to Australia. I have an or accent. Or I people know. say you have an accent. I know, I have an accent. <laughs> so where are you from here? I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland. Okay. And when did you move to Canada? Full time since 2016. Oh, okay. It's recent. Yeah. 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 But the first time I ever came was 2000. And, uh, when was it? 12. So I came 2012, a few months, 2013 for a few months. 2014 for a few months it's hard to get visas yeah so you just come in as a visitor just on vacation and well stuff. that's a whole other place. why would you thing. want to leave those palm trees <laughs> <laughs> the grass is always greener on the other side <laughs> no I just came for a vacation actually me and um one of my other buddies who's still here is permanent resident and everything he's got his own painting company we came for a vacation we just loved it so we were like let's go back for next year we'll go back for a year and see see how it goes so we just kind of kept coming back seven or eight years later or whatever it is. I'm still here. It worked. <laughs> yeah. But back home, you were also doing the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. I left school to do this. It's, it's kind of my mum's fault that I was pushed this way. She didn't push me. I was accepted into college to do like a physiotherapy course. And then uh, my dad's a plasterer. So I did my work experience at his company. You know, when you're at school, they give you two weeks where you go out and experience what it's like to go and work in a, an environment. Co-op, we yeah. call it. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that. And then... That summer, the, the guy, the, the owner, gave me a, offered me a job, an apprenticeship. So my mum says, why don't you take the apprenticeship? She's like, you know, if you, if you, you do your apprenticeship, you, can, you always have that to fall back on. So you can always go back to school or whatever and do, do your physiotherapy. But, you know, you'll be able to pay your way through school and stuff. Well, it's free in Scotland, but you know, accommodation and everything. So it's kind of my mum's fault that I, I took, <laughs> took her advice and uh, got, got into the plaster. Yeah, but it's not a bad fault because, I mean, yeah. you're really good at this, right? Well, yeah. Well, what's even what's even more important is that you're one of a kind. You, yeah, especially here. Yeah. yeah, especially in Toronto. There's there's not many other people doing it. But there is a big market here, isn't there? Or it's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. Yeah. People are appreciating the work. Yeah, I think people are starting to appreciate that it lasts a lot longer than drywall and stuff. There's a few health benefits as well for for using lime. Um, but I think we'll get into that a bit later. Oh yeah, for but, sure. I want to talk about that yeah. as well. Is it only? Uh, wealthy that appreciate this no no there's a lot of um a lot of people who appreciate more sustainable building people who who like to be a bit friendlier to the environment and stuff really yeah that that's probably the biggest market can't wait to get into that with you well yeah, i've yeah. always said that you know you've got clients that always want to say oh we want to be green we want to be a little safer and everything like that and i'm like then don't renovate yeah. Like that's the safest way you can do it. <laughs> so the worst thing you can do is go into an older house and gut the whole thing and yeah, then start applying so right. new, new new materials, new this yeah, and new it's that. Not it's, not it's, it's not the same. So you come in and if there's cracks, because there are cracks over time, over a century or 150 years old, you can go in and fix those cracks. You can yeah. take care of those issues and then you're not demolishing the entire building. Yeah. You're still keeping the advantages of using the line where it's breathable and better movement and things. So resistance yeah. to cracking. 
Yeah, so let's get. I want to get right into it. So how did you? So your mom? It's all your mom's fault. Yeah, my mom. My mom. <laughs> my mom <laughs> put me to this life. No. Right after Mother's Day, we're blaming her. <laughs> well, well, here's the problem. I bet you a hundred bucks your back and arms are hurting, and you wish you would have taken that course. Not at all. No. No. <laughs> no. You love the trades. I do. Yeah. Um. You know, it, it's like everything else. You, you get people who sit in an office all day and they get problems with their wrists and their their backs and their knees from sitting at a desk all day. And their bellies. And their bellies. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to get problems at your work, whatever you do. You do it for so much of your life. Like you're, there's no such thing as a job that I know of where you, you know your your body's fine. Everything's sure enough. I get a sore back every now and again, but. You know, you look after yourself properly, you try and stretch or whatever. It's it's no different to getting a, a sore back from swinging on a chair all day or, or anything else. It's very, very true. Yeah. Even, uh, you know, people who think dream jobs are being a, an athlete or something, you know, they've, they've all got problems with the heart and things when they retire because they're pushing their body so hard. And They take the, the, the biggest toll on their bodies, man. They're falling yeah. apart over time, right? So, yeah, yeah no, you're so. right. Every job has some sort of physical... The perfect job doesn't exist. No, it doesn't. So you just got to love it and you love plastering. Yeah. So when you come up to a client and you've got these clients and you've got this, how do you attack it? How do you work it? How do you, how do you deal with it? So you bring them in. At what stage do, do they bring you into the, the project? The sooner the better. Yeah. Um, usually people leave it too late. So the drywall's already up and stuff, which isn't too late because you can still put lime plaster on top of drywall too late to get the, the, the best effects, your air movement and stuff. So usually it's too late it's, it's not i've only been in a few projects that's been newer builds where where i've gone at the right time um i just finished one up in concordan where um i was in before the walls and everything was studied so there was no drywall up and i could use the wire mesh so tell us about the wire mesh the stages the steps that are involved with it wire mesh is it's about a pain in the ass is uh, it yeah yeah it's, it's not very nice stuff to work with it's sharp when you cut it it's not as simple as just screwing it on. You've got to start at a certain point and work your way from it so you're pulling the mesh tight. There's actually a, an up an up, up, up way and a down way. So an upside down to yeah, mesh. Yeah, there's a, um, like a, a grain or, a yeah. grain or something yeah, like yeah. that to the wire mesh, yeah. And you've got to make sure that's on the right way. And like your internal corners, you don't want to be putting two, two cut pieces in an internal corner. So you, you fold them before you put it in. It just keeps the corner stronger. Because if you were to put factory edges into the corners then you're going to get Crack. cracks yeah. that's all it is yeah. but yeah. there is a corner bead for that isn't there for internal corners no and the exterior corners e exteriors yeah but a lot, a lot of people don't want to use the corner beads so the plaster is strong enough that you don't need any bead at all um you just use a straight edge when you're when you come to the straightening stage and you straighten up that way it's funny you say that because uh, i just started a job today a lady had as an older home and it's the old plaster ceilings where they have the decor on yeah. the ceiling and she says hey can you remove this and i'm like yeah no problem so i grabbed my uh hilti grinder oh, here we go and i put my <laughs> concrete blade on it i got a vacuum set up and i start to try to take it off and i can't believe how strong plaster is yeah i can take crying. concrete apart faster or grind concrete faster than i can plaster yeah so why is it that the plaster is stronger is it because of that base of metal it depends because the, the metal that, that comes into it the only reason i don't use wood is can't find anyone to mill it or for me to buy it uh, there's still companies in the uk that make it and stuff but Every time I ask them how much it would cost to get shipped over here, it's like white noise. You don't, you don't hear anything back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's the only reason I use wire mesh. And when you say you got to make it nice and tight, so you're nailing at one end. And are, are we talking about the sheets, like the wire mesh that I'm thinking that it's like two by eight or something like that? Is yeah. Only, that's what yeah. it is. A lot so of the guys used to use it for like scratch coat. Scratch coat, coat. Yeah. 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 So they're using that gauge, right? Because there's different gauges to well, this metal. It's a heavier gauge. Heavier gauge. Yeah, so, so it's the same pounds. one that you would use on an exterior application if you ever were doing some sort of stone or brick veneer. Yeah. And you're creating a scratch coat with that. Yeah. Got it now. Yeah. So it's not this, the stuff that you find in like Rona and Home Depot and stuff. No, it's no, no, no. Yeah, it's, no. I think that's 1.75 and other stuff 2.2 .2 or something. How are you installing it onto the, because you're, you're still treating it regular two by four, two by six walls. Yeah. And you're using what? Roofing screws. nails or your screws? Yeah. Uh, wafer head screws. So screws with the washer on them. Pan heads. Pan, Pan heads. heads. Yeah. Pan heads. Yeah. yeah. Do you put a scratch coat of concrete on first? No, no, it's all lime and sand. Okay. Just purely lime and sand, that's all it is. And do they come in mix, pre mixed not pre mixed bags, but pre set? No, you got to mix it. Yeah, you got to mix it. Wow. So the, the job that I just did up in Kincardine, um, we were getting the sand from a lumber yard, and then we were screening the sand to get the, the, right, the right grades. And then you put it in a cement mixer, and you mix it in a cement mixer. 
You, you don't just mix it in a bucket. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, it take you years to mix it just in a bucket. We've had some masons in here telling us that uh, the sand here in Canada is a little coarser. Even the fine brick sand is a little coarser. It's good for plastering, though. Is it good for plastering? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so really? The sand's one of the most important parts. That's your binder. So the, actually the granules of the sand is, is really important. It's one of the things you have to find. If they're too rounded, that's too smooth, and your, your mix isn't as strong. So you've got a mason on one job site that's cursing, and you've got a plaster on another job site that's loving it. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, it's hard to keep everybody happy. Do, yeah. do you attack it at two different mixes? Like the first scratch coat would be a more aggressive, coarse yeah. sand? Yeah, and then your, your second coat would be a bit finer, so more of a brick sand. And then your, your third coat's just that you're smooth. It's just pure lime. Like butter. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff to work with. Uh, before we get too far ahead, I wanted to find out what was the wood lath that you wanted to use? Like what kind of wood would that be? It's usually a harder wood. I think over here it was hemlock they used to use and Douglas fir. But they would just mill it and then to the strips. I think there were like three eighths or something or thickness. Yeah, they were like qu quarter inch yeah. 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 by and one then, inch. Is it fair to say that the metal is actually stronger or is it just different? I'm not sure yet. I've not, I've not had to, to rip down too many metal ones. Um, that are full walls. You get the old sort of 1940s to 1960s where the, the, the metal in all the corners, they're quite hard to rip down. Um, but the good thing about the wood lath is it's because it's, it's so old, a lot of time they're, they're pretty well damaged. You can just bang out the middle of it, a hammer and it starts to bring itself loose. The so, other thing that I learned in my research when I was dealing with my team that does all my research. <laughs> yeah, what, you mean those little midgets that work for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> and you can't say midgets in today's climate, man. I mean those little people. <laughs> Lath and plaster and wire mesh and plaster is a thousand, oh, I don't know exactly what the number is, but it's a lot better regarding sound. hundred times better. You will make a much quieter house in between rooms well, than guess, drywall, half inch oh, drywall. I can see that because it's dense, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to take that sound and, and take, exorb it instead of yeah. verberate and, and let it... It's thicker as well. Yeah, because drywall to me is almost like MDF building a speaker box. It's yeah. going to echo, right? Yeah. How thick is a plaster wall when you're all said and done with the three coats? You're about half inch. About a half inch. Oh, yeah. that's not much at all. But no, it's the it's lime. Not as much as people think. Yeah. Yeah. Because but, I've worked in some high rise buildings where condos have been like 50, 60 years old and they're covered in lath and plaster. Yeah. Like, just condos. I've never seen houses in them. It's always been like lath and plaster and condos have yeah. always been chicken wire, right? They used to do the lath and plaster in the condos for the fire rating because it doesn't burn. Yeah, because right. that, that was another thing yeah. I, I read as well, too. It's Even a lot better. Even in condos now, they're still doing a lime gauging plaster on the ceilings. Or you can go type X or whatever, 5 eighths, right? But that just that's not actually fire retardant. That just gives you a longer fire rating. For the type X? Yeah. Is that drywall? That's uh, drywall. Yeah. That's all it does. Um, but plaster lime, it's it's it doesn't catch on fire. No, it doesn't catch on fire at all. Well, there's no skin. There's no paper to burn. Yeah, so that's why it's, yeah. it's better. It's different. Yeah. Can you let us know, like, I'm trying to figure out, I, I respect what you do, and I respect the way it's done, but the cost-wise, what are we talking cost -wise, about? So More than if we were just a hang drywall. So if you're doing three coats of plaster, you're, you're up around the $18 a foot mark. Wow. Okay, it's I gotcha. pricey. Yeah, yeah, it gets pricey. Yeah. But you're um, getting a wall and you're getting a room that's a lot better. Yeah, and you're getting a room that's going to last for a couple of hundred years if you want it to. <laughs> you'll yeah. never have butt joints that you'll see. You'll never have a crack. Never, never screw pops. Never. Oh, screw pops, exactly. Never any of them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Even if you were to put a level five on top of drywall, it doesn't compare to your... Yeah. What would yours be? Level one? It's just, it's I, one level. I've never been able to compare it to... Because I don't know what... I'm not sure what level five is. Like well, level five, is level five is what you actually do because you're skimming the whole surface. But yeah. you do that on the third and final or the fourth, right? Okay, so Over yeah, so butts. usually usually you do three coats, which is like all the joints, uh, the outsides, insides, like normal, not, which would be normal for drywalling. Yeah. And then the last two, you want to skim it out. But some guys actually spray a primer on, which they call it a level five spray. Yeah, but it's not. It's not the same thing. Yeah. I have nothing against drywall and, and guys, because drywall ones are trade in itself. Drywall and plastering, you're getting a similar finish, but it's completely separate processes. And to do to be good at drywall, you you have to be really really good at your job. It's not as easy as the good guys make it look. Oh, I'm not saying I'm not yeah. downplaying drywall. Yeah. I respect drywallers as well too. It's just if I had my choice and I had a thicker wallet, I'm hiring you over a drywaller. 
Yeah. Like I'd rather do a whole house that way, but I can only imagine what the budget will be at that point. Yeah. That's the thing about it. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be insane. So what are the advantage of having a plaster home built instead of a drywall home? We already mm-hmm. talked about sound and fire. It's going to last for a lot longer. You're going to have it. You're going to be stuck with it. Cause if you want to move your rooms and your walls and stuff, you're not, <laughs> you're not having a good time. You better make the right decision. Yeah. Eh? Um, there's health benefits. It's so, so lime, I don't know how much you know about lime, but it's a living material. It's always trying to go back to its natural state, which is a limestone. So it's always working and it's always, it's cleaning your air as, as it's working, which a lot of people don't know anything about. Well, I learned something today is that the top of Mount Everest is all lime. It is? That's what they said. So yeah. at some point in this planet's history, the top of Mount Everest was the bottom of an ocean. Well, That's why there's all that lime up there. So yeah, I, I know about the health benefits of lime and yeah. it's a lot better. So what's in drywall? Drywall is gypsum. well. It's funny you say that because uh, certain team came out with a drywall that uh, will actually like cleans the air. But what is it called? A re- air renew or something yeah, like that. Air renew. I guess their secret ingredients must be lime. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't know how how good it would be because you've still got the paper barrier and stuff. Because I'm guessing if there's lime, it's going to be in the inside of the right. The, you know, the paper it will be in the, the actual inside beside the gypsum. Versus your wall, your lime is right to the surface. It's every, it's all the way mixed through, yeah. How does it paint? Does it paint fantastic? Better, yeah. With latex paint? Not really. You have to do oil based yeah. primer first. If, I if guess. you're using, um, well, there's no oil based primers and stuff. You need you just need to water down your your first your primer a little bit. You want it to absorb into the lime. Yeah, because the it's it's really really thirsty. It's very porous. So as soon as you put your roller on, you know it starts sucking all the water out. So you water down your, your first coat a little bit. I didn't wow. know um, It just gives it a little bit extra time to, for the moisture to sit there a little bit. But there's also lime-based paints and stuff you can get, which is the best option. Who's selling lime-based paints? Yeah, I never even heard of that. I know Barry Affleck does. Textures by Barry or Protec Paint. Okay. Not far from here, actually. He does lime-based paints and stuff. He makes his own. Um, so fascinating. You know so, what? That that's gonna be that's actually gonna be a big game changer for me because if I ever have to paint plaster crown molding, I'm gonna now address it differently. Yeah, it, it's a trick that's used. Um, I don't really know many people who paint. Well, who, when I do my plaster and over here, a lot of people they're they're putting a clear coat on top of it because they like the way it looks and stuff. But I've I've not really went back to jobs to see how they look after they've been painted and stuff. So this is just stuff that I've learned from from back home that's what the painters used to do they used to water down their, their primer coat and always tell that to the clients and i've never really had any problems that wasn't because he was it. trying to stretch his primer was it yeah probably <laughs> <laughs> no I, I would believe can. that it need to be soaked in i think it would have to soak in right do you what's the drying time on when you're when you're doing it that's another one of the big setbacks is you, you've got to leave at least four days between coats wow yeah ideally you want to leave more um, so you're doing three coats and you got to leave four days between, between each coat. Yeah. That makes yeah. you, that takes a long time. Yeah. So are, are you using a big Darby? Yeah. I think the biggest Darby I've got just now is 10 feet. Holy shit. I don't use it very often. <laughs> wow, man. That's a true wall. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually easier than you think to get it straight and true. You just let the Darby do all the work and you're like, this is what I get a lot of people messaging me saying, Oh, I would love to come out and work with you a couple of days and learn how to do this. It, it doesn't work like that. You don't, you, you can't just learn after a couple of days. It takes years to practice. Yeah. Cause, um, the there, key is, there's a question. How many years have you been doing it now since, uh, 13, 12, 13 years, I think 12, since 10, I was 16. Yeah. Well, technically since I was 15, but yeah, I left school a little bit early, a couple of weeks, <laughs> <laughs> but it basically, you, you need the time to learn this. It's yeah. not just like well, pop in the video and watch it and learn it. No, you've got to take the time. Probably one of the only trades that the YouTube apprenticeship doesn't really apply to. You can't just, uh, have a look one night and, and then you're, you can plaster the next day. It's funny you say that because I see, I watch a lot of videos. Um, I enjoy, you know, old art. Yeah. And I see in the States that they're still scratch coating and darbying walls. Yeah. And they're yeah, perfect walls, like yeah. especially in showers and so on. Like bathrooms are completely scratch coats, right? And it's an art. It really is. It's amazing watching guys do this, right? Yeah. But it's fascinating because actually it's funny you bring that up because there was, I discovered something today. Have you guys ever seen the top of the Oval Office in the White House and the plaster work that's up there? Um, I do want to mention that all the white stone that 
is part of those offices and all the uh, monuments are all Croatian marble. <laughs> <laughs> Had to throw that in. <laughs> anyway, so they have the crest in plaster and the very top in the center, and then there's stars. And I'll just like take a peek at that. Wow. Isn't that insane? So if you guys, whoever's listening here, it's just like, like Google it and check it out. Wow. That's that's pretty impressive, and that's that's true to you know. I think it was seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds. That would have been true to that that they did that. But not to be outdone, you've got the prime minister's office and the speaker of the house's office, and that's all plaster. Wow! Now look at that, and that's that's taking us back too as well, right? So I mean, that's all beautiful plaster. Well, it's pretty crazy. I was watching a couple of guys in Indonesia, and what they can do with a trowel and and lime is crazy it's crazy like they're they're making stuff on the exterior like exterior plastering it's unbelievable the moldings they're making yeah and you would think that this comes out of a press or a mold but these guys are hand troweling hand cutting yeah it's a real art man yeah there's not many people can do it i gotta ask you karen what exactly does tight as a mouse's <laughs> waistcoat mean <laughs> uh, it just means something fits really really snug. it's just perfect it's perfect yeah that's all it means all right, it's yeah. perfect all right i just wanted to find out about so that. how do you say that again tight, tight as a mouse's waistcoat <laughs> so my, mice are really small so the margin for error, error oh exactly is, is so small, so. exactly i can i can picture the italian tailor there just taking the inseam <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> um, how are the carpenters enjoying nailing through your lime a lot of them decide to glue on Liquid nails? Yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. Um, really? They'll, they'll choose glue instead of... Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can... If it's thought of in the right way, and, you know, you're, you're supposed to have your... The way they used to do it was they would build the walls and then they would put rules on. Oh, so strips rules, of wood. Strips of wood. So that's what your baseboard and your casings and everything would get nailed to. Yeah. Um, but now a lot of people are just building it regular. Baseboard, they're just getting glued on your facings around your your doors and stuff they're just getting nailed into the jams and it, are you are you putting strips on for your guys or you're just doing no no i just go, i usually just go straight down to the floor and yeah. what kind of glue are you using to put baseboards on it's not just normal i, I don't know i don't do it okay yeah I, I don't do any of the trim work manny was telling me that you have horses and you collect all the horse hair no, it's it's your it's plaster. Plaster. I, I never i never said anything like that got one in my spare bedroom <laughs> <laughs> Come every morning before work so what happened to the horse hair years of adding uh, mm. adding to plaster I, I guess now people they've decided that horses are more for riding now than kind of using for their hair so was it used as a, a as a binding agent is that what it, it was? it's just for strength that's what it it's was. like fiberglass strands yeah. i guess yeah it just it just gives you more strength uh, you can buy goat hair now goat hair seems to be more <laughs> goat hair i love yeah. it but i use fiberglass okay fiberglass strands i think you should go back to goat hair i like that <laughs> <laughs> Because you know what GOAT stands for, greatest of all time. Of all time. I know that one. I know that one. I, I, can you walk us through like the jigs? So yeah, for you, running Crown? Yeah, for Crown. Because you're building your jigs. You're, you're making a, a negative positive to what's existing there. Yeah. And then you're creating a jig. But you have to create more than one jig for every Crown, right? Uh, it depends. If there's enrichments. And um, what is that for the listeners to understand? Little flowers, eggs and darts, dentils, cow tongue. All the fancy stuff that you see that's embedded in the in the plaster. I actually like all of those. The cow tongue, the dentals. I love all of those. Those are all, I love all. Seriously, I they, do. They look good in the same crown. Yeah, <laughs> be a pretty big crown. But that makes it really hard for you. Yeah. So basically, they they're all placed in after. So yeah. You, you build the base crown and then while you're it's adding. fresh though. No. 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 You so it it's completely dry and then they add it on. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. But you basically a lot of the stuff that I do is I don't do much new crown most of it's um fixing up old crown i don't mind telling people this because it's not as easy as it looks you just take a, <laughs> a i tool. always love that when they go oh i could probably do that yeah good they, luck they call you back yeah. <laughs> so you, you just cut a, cut a line in the crown with a, a multi-tool and then you put your i use zinc a lot of guys use sheet metal but i use zinc because it's just a much better in my opinion it's a, a much better uh, metal to work with it's easier to carve it's easier to sand down it's softer it doesn't rust. zinc zinc yeah what are you using to carve it with like i uh, use just tin snips and then tin snips tin snips and files wow just file it down yeah 
Doesn't zinc have like a, I, I know that if you use zinc when you're doing concrete, it, it burns or etches the surface. So does it leave any kind of graying or scratching? No, you're polishing it. So it's, it's like, uh, it, it's very highly polished. Okay. And then what you're doing when, you, when you're running the crown is you're, you're polishing the crown as well. You want that nice flat surface, that shiny surface. And you're buffing with that zinc? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's what gives you the finished product. Yeah. No sanding. No, no. So that's another benefit. There's it's no pretty, it's pretty much there's perfect. no dust in your home after. No, no, there's no sanding at all. And uh, when you're doing crowns, do you have to put chicken wire up or chicken lap? No, no. It depends if it's a really big one, so that it gets quite heavy. A lot of time you'll do a reverse, so you'll you'll take a, the outline of the crown and then you'll you'll take it to your your workshop and then you'll make a reverse. And Out of advantage. silicone. No, you make reverse that you run in solid. It's a big core. And then you're basically your face, the face of your crown is the face of the reverse. So when you pull it off the reverse, that's your smooth, your smooth surface. And the, the advantage of doing that is it's lightweight because your, your crown profile is only a quarter of an inch thick all the way around instead of being that huge mass of weight. As if you've got your, it comes out five inches at the top and three inches from the, along the wall and the back of that's all filled with plaster it's very very heavy so you do the reverse and you, it's, it's a lot lighter weight and it's stronger as well so and you're still putting burlap into it or yeah. you're still embedding it and then what's the i guess what's the, th the trick like i like you burlap, you do so basically what you do is when you get your reverse done so you you, you take your negative jig and you you run your core um you get that perfect so it's like a mirror it's like glass and then you paint it with uh, some shellac so your plaster doesn't stick to it. You mix up your plaster. You mix it just like single cream. So it's very, very watery. And you just pour that on, on the cast. It's quick set plaster, so it sets in like 20, 30 minutes uh, or quicker. And basically you just get a nice, really nice thin layer on top of the, the reverse that's there. And then you get a dust bag, shake some dust on. That gets your, your first thins a bit harder and um, starting to start take up a bit. Then you, you put your burlap on. And then you press your burlap in a little bit. You can't press too hard, otherwise it comes through the face. And then you have a little bit more plaster on. And then you fold up the edges, so you've got double burlap on the edges, because that's where you screw to fix to the wall. To and make it a little bit which, stronger. Which behaves stronger. like, I guess, a paper and drywall. That's what holds the drywall on, right? Technically. I'm not comparing the two, but... Yeah, it's the same idea. Yeah. Usually you would um, you would actually put lath on your, your ceiling edge and your bottom edge as well. So when you fold the, before you fold the burlap back over, you'd put a, a lath in there, a strip of lath. Oh, then, to even make it stronger? Yeah. Or even, so when you screw through it, it's even better to grab, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's not going to, because sometimes if you're putting crown in, you know, if your your screw catches a, a stud too good and it, it just drives the screw right in, it can just explode the, the bottom of the crown out. So it just stops that from happening. And That's, also if your, your ceilings and your walls are wavy and stuff, it helps straighten it out. Are the screws just temporary or are they staying there for good? I keep them in. You keep them in yeah. and then just plaster over them? Yeah, I just countersink them and then fill the holes. It's just peace of mind. Don't I mean, the cool thing it. is that on, on his Instagram feed, he's done a lot of these videos where you can see these, literally yeah. these steps that you just discussed. And I know that there's an art to it. Like, it's not as easy as you think it is. You can watch this video and go, oh, I could do that. Uh -uh. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. I, I get a lot of people asking me if, if I could show them how to do it and stuff. And I have no problem. I'll show anybody that wants to do it, but... There's a just, fee. Yeah. Nah, there's no fee. <laughs> An admission. Uh, admission. Because the, the, the pure fact of the matter is I can show 10 people how to do this and probably one of them is going to be able to do it and they will actually do it. Plus, if, if there's more people who can do it, it's easier for, for me to get some help. Like the, the job I've done in Concordon, I, I put £30,000 of sand on the wall. Holy yeah. cow. Plus, plus by yourself. By myself. So can I ask you, does, does the engineer have to know that you're doing this to a home to structurally re- yeah. And uh, how often do you use metal studs in a project like this? Or do you I've, stay I've, away from I've that? I've never used them. I think there's just a little bit too much flex in them, a little bit bend. I, I would probably still do it. I, would, I prefer wood, but you know, if somebody said they're going with metal, then that... A purist in me, I wouldn't want metal studs. I'd be like, well, I don't want metal studs in there. Well, if you do the uh, commercial metal studs, which is a thicker gauge, it doesn't have a lot Fair of flex. Uh, I, I'm just, you're already using, you know, the lath wire and, and it's environmentally friendly. I think metal is environmentally friendly in somewhat way, right? Yeah. And it's not cheap. Like, I remember I had a customer, I had to remove some crown molding because I was doing some open concept. One of the guys broke off a piece 
and it was plaster. And this home wasn't old. This home was probably 15 or 16 years old, but all yeah. of all of the high ceilings had a real plaster on it. I had to go to a place in Woodbridge and they were charging me $55 a linear foot yeah. to read make a jig and make it perfect so I could yeah. just come back and put it up. Yeah, it's pricey. There's a couple of guys in, in around Toronto who are making it make it a bit cheaper than that. There's a couple of guys more expensive than that. So I found a good deal then. Uh, de- <laughs> depends on the crown. Yeah. It de- depends on the crown. Well, um, I guess it depends on the art because I, I've seen what you've said, but they haven't gone to the extent that you've gone to. The same place I went to, they, they took me in the back and they showed me these 20-foot jigs that they were making. They were buttering them back and forth yeah. and running their own jigs across and... It seemed pretty straightforward, but what you're explaining is real detail. There's yeah. some serious materials in there. There's a lot of guys who do production crown mold, and usually it's simpler jigs, but what what they do is they, they'll run it the same way as, as I explained, but they won't put the burlap and stuff in. They'll get fiberglass, and basically they'll just lay it on the back, which is no good because you're only getting strength in the back of your mold. You need the strength through the whole thing. If you twist it the other way it's actually going to break you yeah. would, i would see that i would think that the burlap would be stronger in the core and it's stronger to both sides yeah it's all the way through instead of just being on that back section i only know this because I've, I've removed some of it and they put it on in a separate batch of plaster so it's like a separate mix so they'll pour the they get the form of the crown and then they'll mix up more plaster and, and put the fiberglass in instead of having just one that makes it weaker mix. right exactly yeah Instead of having one mix where everything's the same. So you're saying layering is actually worse than one solid yeah. pour. When it comes yeah. to lime plaster. Yeah, when it comes to the crown. I, I guess that's like talking about porcelain tile. When you have a porcelain tile that has a glazed porcelain on top, that's the piece that always uh, chips off or flakes or, or cracks off. I would have known I didn't do any research on porcelain tile today. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we got to take a little <laughs> break for our next segment. <laughs> uh we're going to be doing building code talk with Manny. <laughs> okay, so this is a little bit modernized, right? Yeah. Uh, so can you guys tell me what the spacing is for drywall screws regarding at the edge, in the field, and also there's other two, two more requirements attached to drywall screws for building code. Okay, so we're talking minimum code, right? Correct. Okay. How far away from the edge should the screw be? One, in, one inch. It's 10 mil. 10 mil, which half inch. Half inch. Okay. Half inch, Spacing yeah. between uh, screws on the field. On the field, which would be vertical? Vertical. Well, I only, it, from what I know, you only have to have four rows, uh, four screws per row. 400 mil. 400 mil. Which is, you're more metric than Imperial. Yeah, I can't convert. I, actually, I, I should know that. I, 400 mil. I'm having a brain fart right it's, now. Um, it's either just above or just below 16s. 16s. So that, that'll give you the four. Yeah. The other thing is that none of the heads can puncture the paper. That's right. That's or you in get the pop-outs. That's actually in the code. I have to ask you, did you get sealing? Because I was always told to, du- like I always double my screws in the ceiling. Is it five per row for minimum code? Uh, the ceiling is 300. So it's five. Ceiling supports, it's five. 300. Yeah. yeah. So you go five. So ceilings yeah. are 300 mil. That's the spacing on center. 400 mil for verticals. 10 mil from the edge and no puncturing of the heads. No puncturing of the paper. Um, and since we're talking about that, I'd like to mention if you do have a pop out of a drywall screw, you should always put a screw on top of it and underneath it to resecure that pop out. Yeah, because it blows up the butt. But that's not minimum code. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about minimum code. and that's building code talk with manny <laughs> okay and we're talking to kieran here so we're talking about uh the instagram handle is at kr underscore plaster yeah and you can see a bunch of these videos and images that kieran has actually posted and shared it's a true art it is a true oh, art. this is a real art actually yeah. i don't know if you're gonna throw something at me i see a bottle beside you there <laughs> what um, of, of cleaner it's cleaner it's not okay. a bottle okay. of alcohol or Juice. anything <laughs> It's Gatorade, according to you, yeah. from, the, from the 1910s. Hey, you know, you know what? You got to be careful. Uh, that could be super soap. What do you feel about styrofoam uh, crown moldings and not, not as bad as everybody thinks. Obviously, I, I do more traditional methods. Have you installed they, them? No, no. Okay. I was asked it one time, and I ended up not working for the guy. Okay, not because of that. <laughs> okay, it had, okay. It had stuff to do with it, but okay. no. Um, I, I think they've got their place. You know, these new subdivision things that are going up, maybe the, the higher end ones, then why wouldn't you put a, a foam crown molding in when the, the ceilings are a bit higher? You, you can't see it much from the ground. I've been told that the, 
you know, it looks exactly like plaster when it's uh, when it's set, but the, the ones that I've seen that they don't, they, they look more like a, a styrofoam cup when you're up close, um, whereas plaster's dead smooth. And mm-hmm. like I say, I'm not bashing, the, like the foam stuff, it's, it's a hell of a lot cheaper. The, you know, there's no movement, so like it, it's very resistant to crack and all that kind of stuff, but it's just not made for heritage homes. Well, it's funny you say that because uh, in the last few years, especially like in the last two, a lot of uh, foam products had air bubbles in them and a lot of people were complaining about them. Where We just talked to someone just recently and they changed their mix and it's actually a plaster surface yeah and it's really nice and smooth so it's smooth yeah, yeah. no more air holes in it. it it's completely it's 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 advancing right yeah yeah it's not plaster some of them were saying traditional plaster but it's not it's a modified plaster and that's fine it's so the, the plaster in the box that you get at the big box stores or at the drywall suppliers what's in that plaster that um, com- the mud we're used to calling it yeah. compound so or mud like compound there, there's a whole lot of glues and different stuff like that i, I actually don't know what it's made from but yours um, is literally lime and sand. Yeah, lime and sand. For your first two coats, your your final coat is just lime and a gauge and plaster. Can I? So it's and lime, and, it. lime and plaster of Paris. Can I ask a, a really stupid question? Are there any health risks to lime? There is risks. The bags that you get from the States, I think it's in California or something. Asbestos? Is, no, no, there's no, no. asbestos. Okay. I think it's a, a silica risk to that causes cancer. But most yeah. of the stuff you buy from California has that on it. I don't know if it just means they have to put... Well, all California. our plaster has silica, and then you get into yeah. Durabond, it's vermicula. Well, we heard about this on when we did the drywall. We did we did a show earlier on with uh, about drywall plastering. The silica inside of drywall compound is more dangerous than actually concrete silica. Right. And and guys are just not paying attention to it on the job yeah. sites. They're not... At least with concrete guys, they're actually being a little more aware of it, right? Yeah, it's, it's been advertised more that you need to... But I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that the silica... But that's what was Teddy... Saying. Teddy was just telling yeah. us that on the show. And we were like... And well, it's everybody true. knows that anyways. Well, not everybody knows it because he was giving us the analogy of all that loose drywall dust on the ground. And yeah. he picks it up and puts some water on it. And he said, that's basically what's inside your lungs. Yeah. Your lungs are moist and the drywall dust is dry. And that's where you're breathing in. It was in there, yeah. But with your product there, you, you're hardly doing any sanding There's at no all. There's no sanding at all. There's, There's nothing. No, you, no, you don't even have any sanding pads first, on the truck. The first time I've ever seen a sanding pad is when I came over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not that's not a, any disrespect or anything. No, no. Because uh, like we don't do any taping ever. Like plast, plast, not many plasterers back home do taping. It's all plastering. So with yeah, oh, every yeah, single yeah. home is like that. It's all plaster. Yeah, yeah. Or or if you do get taping, it's usually painters and decorators that do it. Wow. Yeah, it's because painting and decorating is a trade like plastering in Scotland. It's four years. It's a four year. I know. I remember Niall told me that. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, wow. That's, yeah. And it should be. In Scotland, if, if you're a plasterer and you're doing taping, you, you, you take quite a lot of stick. Yeah, you get chipped quite a lot. So because it, it's because it's the painters that do it, and you know they think it's it's not as skilled. Yeah. So yeah, we we didn't have any sandpaper in our van. That's funny. <laughs> you know what? Since we're talking about that, so what kind of tools are you using these days? Like, do you, um, pl- plastering. Uh, you're a hawk guy, right? Yeah, yeah. hawk and trouble. Um, no pan. No. Yeah, no, it's I not, hate it's no pans. good. Yeah, it's no good for the stuff we do. Very basic. The tools I use are extremely basic. Heritage plastering and, and stonemasonry is probably the two rawest kind of trades that you can get. Joiners all power tools, skill saws and everything. Plasterers, you use a hawk and a trowel and a straight edge. And stonemasons, it, it's carving chisels, chisels and stuff. That's Obviously, it. you've got mi- mixers and, and stuff like that, and we use drywall guns to put the screws and stuff in, but for actually applying the plaster and stuff, it's a hawk, a trowel and a straight edge and a float. What are you using to mix the material itself? Um, a concrete mixer, a bell mixer. Okay. It used to be plunged. So back in the day, it was like somebody, that was their job all day, was to, to plunge the, the plaster. And that wasn't that long ago. My, my dad, my, my uncle, my uncle Rob, he was my dad's laborer. And that's what his job was, plunging plaster. <laughs> what's your, uh, what's the workability time when, on, when you do a mix? On, on the lime, uh, the, the final coat is very, very quick. It's quick set. So when you, you say quick, 20, 30 minutes? Yeah, 30 minutes if you're lucky. Wow, that yeah. fast, huh? But really, yeah, it's probably go. even faster. Yeah, you got to go. You've really got to go. And I guess that's another thing to ask is uh, temperature plays a huge part of this. Massive, huh? yeah. Moisture, moisture control is one of the biggest things that you got to play with. Moisture control. you got to make sure they're... you got to soak all your walls down so there's... If, if they're too dry, there's too much suction. So it's the same idea as the paint. It dries out too quick and it goes flaky. So you've got to soak the wall down before you mix and before you apply... 
And then even after, you've got to control the suction. If you see it starting to dry out too much, you've got to mist it down with some water. But your first and second coat where it's got more sand in it, what's the workability on that? Uh, longer. Okay, a yeah, few you're, hours? You're using a different kind of lime. You're using a, an NHL lime instead of an autoclave lime because there's, there's a few different kinds of lime. NHL? Um, National Hydraulic Lime. He okay. thought you were talking about hockey. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Okay. Yeah, we get it. We get it. <laughs> you know what I want to get into is I want to get into medallions. I want to yeah. get into those details because I know that on your Instagram feed there, you come in at a lot of historical heritage homes yeah. and they're already somewhat trying to save it because yeah. it's already falling apart, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you attack that whole process? How do you work with that? That Usually what I do is I'll cut it down and I'll take it back to the workshop and then strip the paint off. It can get quite complicated. Um, as long as you can save a quarter of the medallion, then you can make four quarters and make your... <laughs> no circle. way. Yeah. yeah, because every medallion is a repeated uh, design in quadrants. Most of the time. Most of them are. Yeah, most yeah. of them, yeah. yeah. Pi um, square. Yep. Yeah, so the one that, that I last posted about, I think when I pulled that down, it was in like eight different pieces. Oh, wow. Yeah. So then you, you put it all together, piece it together, um, touch it up, bit, you know, bits that have kind of been lost over the decades or whatever, and put new plaster in, fix it, and make it look how it did when it was brand new. And then you pour silicone over the top, and then you can make as many as you want, pretty much. That's yeah, because you can have that mold for life, right? Yeah. But yeah, so you, you strip all the paint off, make it look new, because there's a lot. You, you wouldn't believe the amount of detail that gets lost with the, with the paint. Well, over, over the, the years, years. Yeah. they're adding so many coats of paint, and yeah, you'll lose a bunch of detail. Yeah. Manny has a family Portuguese beaver medallion <laughs> in his bedroom. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> no, I do not. Okay. <laughs> I wish you did. <laughs> um, I got to ask you, Karen, like, what, how, do you, how are the conversations? Are you dealing mostly with the clients or with the GCs or who are you dealing with more? Designers? I don't see designers enjoying this. Actually, a lot of designers are looking at lime now, lime plasters, even because you can put lime plaster on top of drywall. So a lot of designers, and that's a lot cheaper than obviously going the full hog with the, the wire lath and stuff. You can get that done for between 8 and 15 bucks a square foot, um, which is pretty good considering, you know, good drywallers, they're going to be four, five, six dollars a square foot. I don't know. Yeah, no, no. And I guess that makes them a little happier too, because then they can spend the money elsewhere. Well, it's, yeah. you're very close to the same price as a level five. Yeah. In drywalling, a level five is almost that price yeah. to, to completely skim the whole complete surface with just Durabon and like, you know, CGC or whatever yeah. your choice is, right? So who are you dealing with more? Because I, I just, I'm trying to figure out this conversation with the clients, how... I mean, I love it and try to justify it to them. Why do you love it though? It's pure. And I like anything that's pure. It's timeless. Yes. It's just, I, I, I could, okay, I could be on the floor. I could be on the floor with one eye squinting and look at the ceiling and I know that that's plaster. I can tell you if it's plaster or if it's foam, I can tell you. So that's when, when I look at it, it's pure to me. It's original. It's authentic. I think there's a lot of craftsmanship attached to it. That's why I like it. And so it's hard to kind of convey that to a client and for them to really appreciate that yeah. unless their mindset is already that way. Like they bought a certain house in a certain neighborhood for a certain history, whoever had this house before or whatever. And so they're true. They're pure to it as well. Yeah. But I think in track building people, like they're just going to go with foam. It won't matter. Well, yeah. I, whenever I've spoken to anyone, it's only... It's only rich people or well well off people that appreciate plaster. Yeah, like oh. I've heard so many times, like people go to go uh, do a quote, and the homeowners are saying, "No, I want plaster." Yeah, so I actually did a big job in Nova Scotia. I didn't do it. I was I was out there working. I think I was the the twelfth or thirteenth guy that to go out there and the first one that could do it properly. And that was a, a brand new house on the, the beach. This guy, money wasn't an object. And that's what he wanted. He grew up in a, a plaster house, and that's what he wanted. And he paid, I think it was something like, I could be wrong here, but it was something like five or 600 grand just to get plaster in his house. I didn't see any of that. How big there. is the house? Uh, it was only like 4,000 square feet. And he paid that much? Yeah. It was all cathedral ceilings and stuff. And um, it was all intricate crown work and medallions. There was no crown. There was no crown. There was no crown in there. It was all no. plaster. Everywhere was half an inch of plaster. Wow. Yeah. That's eccentric. That's like... Uh, top end that's like the different end of the scale but he's seen the value in doing that yeah what would that same price be if you were to do it just drywall and butt joints and even if you were to do a level five would it be a fifth 
a sixth the cost of that. Like to drywall uh, a a three thousand square foot house is generally about thirty grand, maybe forty yeah. grand. Well, there's different. I mean, there's no. You know, there's different prices. Yeah, you but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to get ballpark and, here. Like, if we're, I, I think a four thousand square foot house is probably thirty or forty grand, and if you're plastering at five hundred grand, yeah, that's what it cost the client. There was a lot of messing around. Okay, not from me, but yeah. um, like all the guys that was there before, and he was putting them up in hotels and things. So that wasn't that was like oh, everything. so there was a lot of per diem costs. There was a lot of yeah, extra costs on top of that. Um, there was people flying up from the states. There was guys from New York, St. Louis, Charleston. Are there a lot of guys in the States that do this? A a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys. I've seen in Boston. There's quite a few guys doing... We'll split up. So heritage plastering. I don't know. There's a lot of guys in the UK. Maybe one or two in in the States that I've I've seen. That I know of. There might be more. That are real guys. Yeah. And then there's veneer plastering. So you plaster the whole walls and stuff. But it's just not lime based. It's gypsum based. But you're, you're still getting a plaster finish. How do you feel about that? Do you still like it? Yeah. Yeah, I still think it's... Because the finish is still true lime. Yeah. Well, gypsum. Gypsum. Yeah, gypsum. It's a polished gypsum. It's a polished gypsum. Yeah. I've seen guys do that, and and it actually looks really nice. I have a problem with plaster. The one one big thing I have a problem with plaster, I've done a lot of commercial work. Yeah. I've worked on a lot of old homes. We call them blowouts. I constantly have to repair these blowouts. I was just repairing a two by two foot blowout today. Yeah. And you know, the, the paint holds back all that moisture underneath and then it pops off and then the plaster falls off. Is that because it's not breathing because of the paint? A lot of the time, what it'll be, it can be a paint that's causing a problem or it could be if it was a, a brick exterior house and they've put stuck over the top or they've painted it so thick that the air can't get in and out, uh, messing with the, the moisture and stuff and the airflow. And that causes a lot of problems. It could just be age, you know, somebody, they, they built a house in 1890s or whatever, and then in the 30s or 40s or 50s, they put HVAC, or earlier than that, they put lights and things. When you're raggling the house to put all this stuff in, you're, you're causing problems. If they built a house back then and they didn't touch it until now, it would still be fine. You wouldn't have any blowouts or anything, because nobody's moving rooms, nobody's putting a kitchen island in that's adding however many thousand pounds of weight or... You know, and that's where the cracks are coming in. It's just when we modernize homes and we do certain things to a breathable home yeah. is what yeah, it starts that's to affect. Damaging. Yeah, you yeah. guys are both right. I learned that a long time ago from an older guy. He said, if you're going to do even one room in your house, uh, in your house, you're going to change the whole dynamics of your yeah. home. It's not going to breathe the same. It's going to start having yeah. problems, right? So I did a settler's cabin up in Fenland Falls. I think it was 1840s. It was a, a farm. So it was like in the middle of nowhere. It was, um, it was like a 10 minute drive into, is there a town called Fenland Falls? Well, there's Finland Falls. Canada. There probably yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I used to go to this place called Finland Falls in Aurelia. So, so I was asking. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but it was an 1840s house, uh, settler's cabin and it, there was lime in there. And when we opened up the walls, opened up the walls one day, went back a couple of days later, whatever it had been raining and there was lime sitting outside on the grass. I picked up the lime and it was. It was pliable in my hands. It started to go soft again since the 1840s. Wow. Because it's a living material and it can do that, that's what resists all the cracking and stuff as well because it moves with the, the, the building. Flexibility of yeah, it. Yeah, so your, your wood and everything expands, so does your plaster and your, your stonemasonry and stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's what happens with it. Well, yeah. we were talking about that hot lime. It's the same. It behaves the same. With it's the funny that joints, yeah. when you're using lime, it actually, even with hot lime or with this lime, it has flexibility. It's yeah, pretty cool. a lot of flexibility, yeah. Why is it that plasters always leave old newspapers in their work? Time capsule, I guess. <laughs> a lot of the old newspapers used to be insulation. They would stuff the newspaper up there for insulation. There, yeah, there's been some cool articles that yeah. I've found like from like... It's funny. You and, do demo and you find them. Yeah. You find them all the time. I actually enjoy it. A lot of times there was... Uh, it wasn't the plasterers. It was the guy who was laying the floor upstairs. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah, they'd be sitting having their lunch and just throw their paper down and... <laughs> Put their floor in the top. <laughs> it Actually, hasn't it hasn't changed today, man. It's still going <laughs> on. They're just throwing different objects in there. Do you have any famous locations that you've done? I did. I worked in New Zealand for a little bit, and I did a war memorial over there after oh, the earthquakes. Wow. That was yeah. that was pretty. Uh, I enjoyed that. That was a lot uh, of repairs, or because of uh, just because of what it meant to everybody in the the whole village and stuff. It was a small town called Littleton, just outside Christchurch, um, and obviously they had the big earthquake and things. And this was kind of like the center part of the town. 
and they had like a big opening ceremony for it and stuff and it was just quite nice to see how much it meant to the actual people of that town yeah so I, I was quite proud of that one made it look really good I've done a lot of work in kind of bigger houses in Edinburgh and stuff and churches and stuff in Toronto not many it's either rich people with a lot of money or or poorer people who just want to have a, a cleaner living space and <laughs> <laughs> want to be a bit more so you get the are you extremes are you finding yeah. anybody that's uh, aware of the the health benefits like doctors or naturopaths interested in, in any of this kind of stuff not really no it's usually people who are, are um more interested in like the environment as a whole really a lot of like a lot of green living yeah thoughts yeah. huh? and yeah. they've done their homework they went online they know what lime is and, and they know all about it yeah and then i guess they also did the research on the gypsum based products and learned about that as well too it's just so into the market now like everyone just doesn't really think about drywall that way yeah it's been so forgotten about that you know a lot of people don't know the pros and cons and yeah it's so expensive compared to the you know like drywall and stuff that, that that's another thing uh, but what's the cost of a life you know, yeah. and health risk later on, right? So we're actually planning a podcast soon uh, with somebody that's going to be talking about mental and aging and what you should be doing for your house and yeah. your environment. It's not just a home anymore. It's more than that, right? Yeah. Well, what, back when people used to build their houses, they built it to raise their grandchildren. You know, people weren't buying houses to to flip them and, and sell it no. or hold on to it Keep it in the family. Yeah, yeah, they were built to last because you're spending so much money. It's an investment in your, your life. It's not just an investment for a few years before you can upgrade or make a little bit of money. And people were buying these houses to move into and to live into. And that was it. Well, I mean, now I, it's completely different. I think our grandparents were really brilliant. Um, you know, most of our most of all of our grandparents or family were originally farmers and they were yeah. buying land. We weren't buying houses back then. We were buying land. Yeah. And that's old money. That's new money now. What's the connection with you with Willowbank, the school? I did a class down there. Okay. Uh, it would have been two or three years ago now. Are they doing good things? Yeah, they're doing really good things. Teaching a lot of kids about um, heritage and, and sustainability and you know the, the older world way of doing stuff. Are they only one of the few or I guess Algonquin is another one? I think Algonquin, yeah. They um, do it as well too, huh? As far as I know, that's only two schools in Canada that I know of. Um, I think there was maybe another one in BC. As far as I know, that that's the only people doing it. And you were teaching plaster or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was doing plaster. The, the time I did my class, there was a bit of uh, changing going on. I think the the person who was in charge of the whole school was on their way out. And it, I don't know what happened. How were the kids when you were teaching them? How were they reacting to Brilliant. it? Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. They, they all wanted to be there. It's not like a... Like a school where you go in, like a general, like a regular school. Nobody was school. dozing off. Yeah. Nobody, nobody was on the phone. They yeah. were there because they were passionate. Yeah. yeah. And they wanted to be there. They were asking good questions and stuff. They weren't sitting playing on their phones. And Were most of them different. like mutters already? No, no. Lots of different backgrounds. I don't think I'm allowed to tell you for the confidentiality, but there was one guy who, um, I think he was a cabinet maker or, or a a master carpenter or something. Oh, so they have different specific trades coming in and uh, on their own time and they're teaching yeah, there's, the skills. Yeah, there's lots. There's a blacksmith. There's oh, wow. uh, stonemasonry. That's wicked. Stain, stained glass windows. They That's do all amazing. That kind of stuff. Yeah. The students, they're, they're not all kids as well. You know, some of them are they're in their 30s, 40s, for whatever reason they've decided. They That's still have. kids. Still kids, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a cool, cool school they've got down there. I left it open to, to go back and do more classes, but never heard again, so I don't know. Where are they located, Willowbank? Where is the school? Niagara on the Lake. Oh, they're just, up there. Just outside Niagara on the Lake. Yeah, yeah and I actually, I wanted to, I reached out to them. I just sent them a message, so I'm yeah. hoping to, if we could do a podcast with them, because yeah. I'm really fascinated by that as well. It sounds like if you become a plaster, you become part of a secret family. Like Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> um, saying that, I guess in Scotland, uh, in Scotland, there's a lot of boxers, and I'm leading to something. Like box, I hope box, so. You guys got a lot of boxers so. there, right? I hope so. Like fighting boxers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, now I understand why they're punching punching bags all the time. Because if you punch plaster, you're going to break your knuckles. Yeah. So <laughs> in Canada, people love breaking our thin little doors, our cardboard doors, <laughs> and punching drywall. through drywall and thinking they're tough. But in Scotland, if you punch a wall, you yeah, better yeah. go through. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to come funny. off the winner, that's for sure. Yeah. So I guess it's really fair to say that plaster, like the true art of plastering, is a dying trade. Yeah. If you're the only person that we know that's in Canada, maybe there's another guy or two, it doesn't matter, a girl. But if that's it compared to what other trades are out there, 
Yeah, it's it's a shame. It's a shame. I want to start a, a course one day, like a, maybe a college. I don't know if maybe Willow Bank would be interested in doing like pla- more plastering courses or whatever. But like everything, it's time and money. Uh, right now, I'm not in a position to be able to do that. I think it'd be such a shame for for it to kind of die out. Because I think I that's mean, the only way you're going to be able to find people. Well, yeah. uh, maybe this is a good time to talk about it. If there's someone listening that wants to become an apprentice, are you looking for one? In a few months, I'm, I'm hoping to open up to start looking for one. Depends. There's there's a lot of things uncertain at the minute with everything that's going on. and But if everything settles down and, and goes back to norm, well, what was seemed as normal, maybe I will be in a position to be able to. And what kind of person are you looking for when you are ready? Somebody that's willing to learn. Somebody that's not looking just for a career that's going to last a couple of years. Because you only get to in a couple of years and you only start getting good. Um, you've got to do a lot of nitty gritty first. Somebody who's willing to see it out. And uh, yeah, just somebody who's going to turn up on time. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's tough. Um, we, we hear that one a lot. Well, yeah. What was the uh, most valuable lesson that you learned from you know, your family? That you, your reputation is worth more than money. Which it's is a tough true. one to take. Because <laughs> if, if it wasn't, then uh, I'd probably be in a much better position. Yeah, I was always told never to let money get in the way of your reputation. Mum always told me that when things get tough, you've always got your reputation, but, you know, recessions and stuff. The guys who've got a good rep- reputation, they're the ones that are staying busy through these recessions. You're so like, right. Yeah. And the, the guys that, are, that, are, that don't have a good reputation, they just go out of business. I hear people saying that there's no work out there, and it's endless work. Yeah. There's so much work. Yeah. And it's really about your character. If you establish yourself as quality guy that cares that has pride you will always have work no yeah. matter what no matter what price no matter what yeah somebody that just the uh, you know you, your work you spend so much time at work you know you, you spend half your life working like why not do it properly and enjoy it and same that goes with the people you work with like make yourself approachable work with people that you enjoy working with you spend so much time with them why would you not want to do that that's and right. if you can do more things on your your terms, just by having a good work ethic and you know having the right values and stuff, then your life's going to be so much easier than these guys who are scratching around looking for work and things because they're. I they agree. Do it properly. One hundred percent. I noticed on your feed there that I didn't see any plastic corner beads. I don't use a lot of corner beads. Okay. How do you make a corner? You just form it in plaster. You form it in plaster. Yeah, and just use a straight edge. You put a straight edge down, that big 10-foot straight edge I was telling you about. You just... You ever do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I mean, it's always been corner beads yeah. and metal metal or wood to, you know, flush out walls. But I've never actually... I, I mean, I use a Darby too. I, I have a 10-foot Darby, but it's for concrete. I have plaster Darbies. I use them all the time because I'm always feathering more than four feet. I could imagine it's a definitely an art, but I don't work with plaster. And anytime I have ever touched plaster... It's been so impossible to sand. Yeah, it's you, been so impossible to chip. Yeah. It's been so impossible to grind. It's it's, it's, an, it's a totally different art. It's not yeah. something I'm used to. It's horrible if you don't know what you're doing with it. Or yeah. if you don't, you don't know the, the little tricks and stuff. So I'm fascinated that you build a corner out of plaster. You don't necessarily use a corner B to do that. But that's the same thing you do for bullnose corner. Yeah. Where the very first time I was in an older house and I actually was beginning the dem- demo, I just chipped away at it because I was curious. Yeah. And it was solid plaster. Yeah. <laughs> and it was beautiful. And I don't care about any plastic bullnose corner bead. I cannot stand that compared to a true lime plaster bullnose. Well, everything has its place, right? No, it doesn't. Yeah. It I'm does. sorry, it doesn't. <laughs> the thing I don't like about the, the plastic um, bullnose corner beads is you get the top and the bottom, you've always got a transition. Well, they make that transition to go to a corner. Yeah, but it's always a transition. Yes. That's always a weak point. You're always going to get cracks and stuff in there. 100%. Um, you tap on it. You know it's plastic. You look at it, you know it's plastic. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, yes. to, I don't own a plastic company at all. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't like plastic for the environment, but I, I do know that it has its place. Uh, houses are being built so fast and they're so green yeah. that they're settling that you can't use metal corner beads anymore. It's creating more problems and more cracking in the normal compounds that where the plastic is actually allowing for the movement and the settlement, you know, that they say that two, three years that a house is still green. Yeah. I mean, they got their place. Yeah, it just yeah, depends on your budget. Place. It depends on your budget and what you think a home should be. 
Yeah, everything's got its place. You know, you, you go with the, the plastic corner beads, you go with a, a level five drywall finish instead of a plaster finish, whatever. Like people have got their different reasons and that's fine. No, I'm not, I'm not here trying to tell everybody you have to do plaster. Oh, uh, I am. You, you, do, you, <laughs> you, you do what you can afford. You know, you do what you can afford, you do what you want, you make sacrifices in other places. It, that's just what happened. I, I know where that place is for your plastic corner beads. There's a bin outside that you could put it in. This is the difference between the three of us. We all have different opinions. Yeah. No, no, I'm um, skewing more to and, him. And I'm Manny not has you. a very strong opinion, but so do I. I, I actually like tearaway strips and I, you know, I, I, I deal with more traditional uh, blue collared homes, white collared homes. Yeah. You guys are more custom, you know, classic hit, uh, historic, you know, heritage yeah. homes. And there's a beauty to it. You know, you go to a castle, you go to a church, you go to an old home, you're going to enjoy the beauty of yeah, technology well, at that know. time, right? I have a 140-year-old home I live in. I got cracks all over the place. Yeah. But what's, that's because of the, the breathing. Why is it happening next to being 140 years old? And how do I repair it without taking it down? The same way you would, re you know, when you see guys cutting back their, their butt joints to make like a V? Yeah. That's what you want to do. In the uh, cracks. In the cracks. Cut all the cracks out. And then you want to fill it with a plaster. You can, you can use, just for cracks, you can use gypsum-based plasters. You know, it's not going to affect the breathability too much just in a crack. And then just give it a tight skim over with some lime and um, casting plaster. What is an, an average price that you would charge for going into an older home like that to clean up all those cracks? It could be hourly really time and materials. There's no way you can go in because, you know, you might start cutting, cutting out a crack and the next thing you know, half the wall's coming down. So what is the plaster making these days? What are you guys, what are you charging? A hundred bucks an hour. That makes it plus material. Plus I'm material. becoming a plaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Everybody that, use plaster, please. <laughs> that's, um, it sounds like a lot, but I've got, I've got a vehicle to run. I've got tools to buy. No, it's a I've business. Got, it's yeah, like it's you're business. the business yeah. arriving on the job site. And the thing is your skill set is the business. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, if I had somebody working for me, they're not going to be making that. That's what it costs to run the business and yeah. well, put the, fuel in the truck. That's the years insurance. of you learning your art. How long has it taken and how have you made a name for yourself? Instagram's helped a bit because I think people aren't used to seeing it. So they get quite intrigued when they see it and they, it's a bit different. You know, it's, there, there's a lot of drywall and tiling and stuff on Instagram. This is a bit, I think people enjoy it. It's a bit different. People have older Because not houses. everybody can do what you do. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just a bit niche. Um, I haven't really done any advertising. Uh, it's all I word just, of mouth, huh? Yeah, just word of mouth. I had a, a red van, which had a tiny decal on the side. <laughs> uh, that, I think that's about as good as my advertising went. <laughs> well, I guess people know you because you're one of the very few guys that knows how to do the real art. Yeah, and there's a couple of contractors I do regular work for. But yeah, m most of the, the phone calls I get, it's like, hey, I got your number from so-and-so. Can you come and look at this or do this or do you think what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, I'm starting to get a little bit more work through designers now. To That's actually, good to hear. Yeah, they're they're starting to to call for for um, like a hard finish, so like a, a veneer finish now. Is that because um, they're customers or because that's what they're in, starting to enjoy? To I be think it's different? what they're starting to enjoy. You can tint the veneers and stuff, so you can get any color you want. You can make it look like this table. You can you can do a lot of stuff. And like you're that. doing it to a polished finish, right? Yeah. So there's no sand in. It's all. Wow. Dead smooth, you don't have to paint it. All the traditional homes back in the day, obviously the homes were plaster. Is there a problem with wallpaper? Oh, does wallpaper love plaster more? Wallpaper used to be a quick fix. So it used to be cheaper to put a lining paper on your cracks instead of getting your, your cracks fixed. Wow. So it's a stucco spray back then. Pretty much. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> wow. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, and now so it's a luxury. Like, yeah. Yeah. So because it's expensive. Wallpaper and. and in Scotland and when I was in New Zealand as well, actually, it's pretty cheap for just a basic white that you can paint. So a lot of people used to buy the lining paper, put that on and paint the paper because it's cheaper than getting somebody to come in and fix the cracks. Really? That's ah. how they used to do it? Yeah. That was the norm for a long time. That's interesting. So you're saying Scotsmen are very good at hanging wallpaper then? Yeah, well, my buddy that I came over with, he's fantastic. He does all the, <laughs> all the fancy stuff where you've got to... I need, I need his number too. What's yeah, his handle? What's uh, his uh, Ross Johnston, painter, decorator. Okay. Oh, Ross we got to get him on, man. <laughs> yeah. If you're referring him, I want him on the podcast. No, he's good. He's, I gotta, uh, like I say, it's a four-year apprenticeship for painter and decorator in Scotland. So he's wow. fantastic. He knows it. Yeah, his, his phone's ringing off the hook and he, he can't keep up with the work that he's got. Do you have a favorite crown? 
Is there a particular crown that you like that you just... A nice gold one with lots of jewels in it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think if all the other crowns, they've got their place. They've all got their place. Crowns are a status thing. You know, all the crowns are different. Did a job for, for a guy who owned um, a brewery back in the day, uh, an 1880s house, and he had hops in his crown. What? Uh, yeah. Really? You know, I think it's... Uh, oh, what's the guy's name? You know the, the horse racing guy, the Northern Dancer? Is it Northern Dancer? It's the famous one. I don't, um, I don't know horses that well. Yeah, it's, I think if every single racing stud can get traced back to this horse. He's like the most famous horse oh, in history. Oh, wow. Day. Okay, yeah. really? So that, that was um, up at Young, Young and uh, no, Bay, Bayview and York Mills is where it used to get kept, the stables. And in that crown, there's horses. I like the differences. I like so all these crowns that were from history. People were using them as status. Yeah. So you go into the dining room. It's a big, beautiful crown, big medallion, be a coat of arms, all that kind of stuff. You go into the servants' quarter. There was still a crown, but it was just a tiny, small crown. Or it's you go into the entrance hallway, the vestibule. It's it's a smaller crown, but it's still really quite interesting. Nice. Eh? So yeah, the, yeah. Every, every room was different usually. And it was designed like that on purpose. Yeah. And now everybody's doing every room the exact same. Which doesn't make any sense, right? Because the real way of doing it is every room is supposed to be done based on what that room is, right? Is yeah. that the idea? So, yeah, so I've always said that. I've always like, this is the room, this is the dining room, this is the kitchen, this is whatever it is. You shouldn't travel the same crown. But that, that explains why now everyone's doing open concept. There aren't separations in the home anymore. Yeah. The well, rooms used, aren't being used like they used to. Yeah, it used to be um, for heat. You know, you, you'd have a vestibule because... If you yeah. open the front door to let someone in, all that cold air is coming in. It's not yeah. as easy to heat. It was all practical. Yeah. So the rooms were smaller because it was easier to heat and it was, you know, it, was, it felt more homely. Whereas now you've got all the, the furnaces and radiant floor where you can make it as big as you want. It's still going to be a nice heat. It's just bringing more light in. Are there rules to the crown? Like, do you, is there a, a statement on where you terminate or where you turn or where you stop? My, my favorite way to terminate is... Uh, uh, 90 degree so you return it back into the wall and you make sure you make it look like you're running into the wall that's the classiest way i think what about all the fancy cool kids that are taking all the crowns that are made out of wood and then putting 15 different degrees of all kinds of degrees and corners and angles and all this other stuff that's great <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. his way of saying that's bullshit <laughs> whatever make, whatever you're happy with do it i don't know there, no, no and i agree with you it's like it should just should be terminated right into the wall done that's where it stops yeah. i agree yeah i'm just thinking about um how how people are trying to reinvent the wheel when we can't even do what our forefathers have taught us yeah we're forgetting about all the most amazing technology that we have at our hands and we're trying to still reinvent things but we never did master what they mastered that's one of the biggest problems is nobody wants to work as hard as they used to everybody's looking for a a cheaper shorter less labor intensive way to do stuff and it's sometimes it's just you just can't do it with the gonna, top dollar attached to it yeah everybody wants to the maximum amount of money yeah they want to flip these homes and buy them for for a small renovate them for small and then sell for millions of dollars and you're never going to be able to do that like it's just not it's not a sustainable way of will you get the return if you actually do it this traditional plaster way will you get you're selling to a certain segment of the market yeah and um if, if you're doing if you're building a new home you're putting plaster in then it doesn't stop there you know you're going to want to put proper casings and proper doors and proper windows in you're not going to put a plaster in and then Go down to Lowe's and put a three-inch baseboard on. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> Who uses three-inch baseboard anymore? Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, there's a place and a time and uh, there's a blue-collar kind of crowd. and <laughs> Basements. <laughs> three-inch. Uh, Karen, is there a detail that you haven't done yet that you want to do? I've been pretty lucky. I've, I've worked in a lot of different stuff in a lot of different houses. And when I was at college as well, we'd done a lot of different stuff that we used to do. They would do it to show you. Stuff like um, vaulted ceilings and barrel ceilings and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I think I've covered most of what I would like to cover when it comes to plastering. I could only imagine what a barrel plastered ceiling would Beautiful. look like. Flawless. Yeah, it would be nice. What's been your most difficult challenge in plaster? Finding it over here. Wow. <laughs> well, I was going to ask Holy you, wait, where God. are you? Okay, so who's supplying you? Who's Skycon. There's a couple of different places. Skycon? Skycon building products. 
It's a uh, Eddie is Stone. They? Finch in the four hundred. Finch in four hundred. Eddie Stone. Yeah. Sk- and it's called Sky Sky Skycon. Skycon building products. They're fantastic guys as well. They're really good. And that reminds me, we totally forgot to give Mark at Skylux. We never forgot. <laughs> we were just waiting for the right time. <laughs> this is obviously this isn't isn't his workshop. Is this just like the This is his room? break room. That's his break office room? there. This is his break room. And uh, but that, that's his workshop in there, so that's where he does all the nice. I guess ACM um, stuff. But he has allowed us to make ourselves at home, and this is home base for the construction life now. Yeah, so it's we nice. appreciate it, and we keep on forgetting to thank him. Well, you know, he he <laughs> believes in he believes in the vision that we all have on this podcast, and that means you and everyone else that's been part of the podcast. Uh, we're trying to change the industry back to what it used to be yeah. or make it better. I know respect the next trade. We're, we're all in this together and this is how we make our money. We need to respect this industry and yeah. this trade. Everybody and if we're not, other, we're right? just going to, it's just going to go to shit. And Mark sees that vision and uh, you know, he's one of the leaders in, in his business and, and there's a reason for it. Something, Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Something that I've noticed um, big time, over over here since I've been working is um, people look down on the trades, you know. People look down on it like you you, you know you weren't going to do well at school or whatever. So it's kind of like a last ditch. You notice that me. here? Big I feel time. the same way. Huge. When Huge. you first got here, you noticed, and you're yeah. still noticing it to today. Yeah. Yeah. Really. People like <clears throat> when we were going out and stuff bars. As soon as you you told people you're in the trades, a lot of them would just. Wouldn't even. Oh, I know, because most of the guys that I work with, they're all younger, so they're all on Tinder. And the moment that they tell any Tinder date that they're that's in the it. trades, that's it. The date is done. It I might don't be know. Really, I don't know uh, about that. Wait I, a second. I'm just. I'm just pe- going to tell you, I've never been on Tinder, <laughs> uh, and I've been married for a long time. But before I was married, when I was with women, they always told me that construction workers always spent more time and attention to the women. And the were, office guys didn't because they were right, playing with that, the boys. No, we'll get back to plastering. <laughs> <laughs> that had something to do with plastering. No. <laughs> do you know when bull noses started? They came after the corner, right? Or they, before? They, they probably would have been around about the 1700s as well. Because they, when they were doing lath and plaster, it was it was done, all the, the bull noses would have been done the same time as the crown. Yeah, that's what I figured, right? Yeah, so, so it's you, all encased at the same time. Yeah, you do your, your, your first coat your key coat and then you do your straightening coat and then when your straightening coat's done you put all your rules on the ceilings and things to run your crown mold and do your bull noses and then your your final coat is what you skim to cover all your screw holes from put well it would have been nails back then for your your rules for running your your crown and it just levels everything out and makes everything flat and true and tidies it all up if there's one trade tip that you can teach our listeners what is it that you can share i think you guys have nailed it on the head the respect the next trade okay that's a good one because someone should trademark that. There's always <laughs> <laughs> there's always going to be somebody coming after you, and there's always going to be people before you. So, you know, if, if everybody does their job right, you know, these building sites and stuff, they're a lot happier place. You know, how many times have I gone in after a trade, and he's costing me money, and it's just not fair. Yeah, he made some money, but I'm not. It's not your fault. And he doesn't care, or she doesn't care, They've whoever it may be, right there. Yeah, or the team doesn't care. But it all starts with the leaders also. Like you lead by example. So the general contractors, the homeowners, the designers, they all have a big part to do with how, you know, you're leaving the next trade. Yeah. Until that changes, we got a big fight ahead of us. So yeah. I got a couple of questions. Splatter dash? Splatter dash. That's, um, <laughs> What's splatter dashing? So if you're putting up new blocks, so new construction, new blocks, I think they're called building blocks or... Oh, you mean concrete blocks? Concrete blocks, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So I just did a job where they, they used lime mortar, um, and it was dressed sandstone on the outside, absolutely beautiful. And then the building blocks on the inside, but the building blocks, they can be too smooth. So you put our splatter dash on, and basically it gives your straightening coat a key, something to stick to. So the, the splatter dash is just rough, rough stones, pretty much, small ones, but rough. And you throw it on the wall. It's a lime sand mix. And it's really watery. It's horrible, horrible stuff to do because you're Sounds splatter messy, on the wall. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I know the Irish guys call it a scud coat. Okay. Um, and what do, what do the creations th- call it? Oh, they don't do it. Well, <laughs> yeah, they call that a bomb coat. Bomb coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and basically it just gives your next coat something to, 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 bite. S- to stick to, yeah. Okay. When the, the other surface is too smooth. And you do use some drywall when you have to build up 
some repairs for crown that are a little too heavy, you'll end up using some drywall pieces, strips. No, that's just no. for the core. That's just for the core? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you're using the core, basically you, you use off cuts of drywall to build out the core so you're not using as much plaster. Got it. Just reusing stuff. But plaster's light. I, like it's not heavy at all. No, it's not. I've picked up plaster <laughs> pieces that I've picked up for the, from, the, from the companies that had to make Take the pieces. Take it from a professional. He and says that it's so heavy. Light. That, that would have been the, the crown ones. Yeah, so they're so thin and light. That, that's the ones that you make off-site. And then they go on, but the actual core that you run it from, it's a big piece of plaster. It's okay. heavy. Do you guys ever do wainscoting with plaster? Yeah. You can make baseboard in plaster. You can do anything in plaster. Well, anything that can get a shape, but would, would it, it would get damaged, wouldn't it? Or No, plaster is very resistant to cracking, uh, to, to bashing and stuff. And to, it's, it's really hard surface when it's done in polish. When's the last time you did baseboards or uh, wainscoting or have you ever done it yet? 2016, just before I came over here. I did a curved staircase and the baseboard I curved around the, the staircase. Wow. Because they couldn't get the wood, the wood to curve it around. To do yeah. it. That was the last time I did it. And you duplicated the exact wood? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because you'll take a mold of it yeah, and then you'll create it. Well, that one was run on site. So you'd actually build up all the plaster on site and then skim it. Yeah, skim it around. What's wow. that actually called? What's that called when you're actually pulling? Um, it's in situ. In situ. In situ, yeah. I N dash S I T U. That's what it's called. Yeah. So you run, run an in situ. What other little terms do we know that we don't know about? Um, the form that you're talking about, the thing that gives you the shape, that's a slipper. A slipper. Slipper, yeah. And then, <laughs> you mean the silicone thing? No, the, the one the that's made wood and zinc. Yeah, yeah, the jig. Oh, that's called a slipper. A slipper, yeah. That's really interesting. I like um, it. <laughs> what else? Small tools, you get lots of different ones. They're the things that you, you use to butter up your corners and things. It's all the little tools for doing the, the fine stuff. The small tools, you got like spade and flat and oval and all that kind of stuff. Like the knives? Yeah. Okay. And then the one for doing the internal corners is called a joint rule. A joint, joint rule? Yeah. Why is it called a joint rule? I don't know. It's been called that for three or 400 years. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> what's, uh, what's your oldest tool that you still use? The oldest tool that I still use is a hammer probably from the early 1900s. No way. Yeah, I've got an antique... Uh, an antique market but one that i've had i've got a couple of joint rules that my dad's had from when so at least i don't know 15 20 years wow yeah, we used to make a lot of our own tools because it's quite hard to find them and yeah especially since i've came over here like i make my own joint rules and stuff because nobody carries them, them well, here no skycon actually does but they're just a little bit too heavy for for my liking lee valley wouldn't have anything I don't know. I've never checked out Lee Valley, actually. You've never gone to Lee Valley? Never you know what, there. though? But yeah, you should go. <laughs> you know what? They do have some... I think they would have something Some there. pottery yeah. stuff, right? I'll check them out. Uh, um, I guess you must be pretty good at making clay pots. I've never tried. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried. Maybe you should come up to my little garage workshop and we could do it like in that movie. On the little pottery wheel. What do you oh, mean? Yeah, a, yeah. a ghost? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now I got that song stuck in my head. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you, Carlito, if you were to build two different houses, one traditional drywall, you know, three passes, you know, whatever you Columbia, what do you call them? Which tools you use? I use tape tech. Tape tech yeah. and compound. And you build another house, all plaster, wire, and do it all that way. I guarantee you you'll be able to walk through both of them and you'll feel a difference in the house. I could guarantee that there would be no mice problems in his home because the new, okay, so all the, a lot of the new homes that I'm, I'm working on, when I go in and, you know, do repairs, I'm finding that there's like, there's so much rodent problems. Yeah. Uh, we have a farm and one of the way to keep all the, all the small pests out is chicken wire. Really? Because what happens is they tear their arms off when they try to, to go through it you're blue, right blue you, a plaster home <laughs> with chicken and la, uh, like lath wire would be like pretty much bulletproof to termites like not termites but hey, even in termites yeah it probably wouldn't they wouldn't be able to get through yeah yeah what do you think the cost difference would be three times four times it depends if you're going with uh, higher skilled guys in the, the newer construction you know you're going to be maybe I, I wouldn't even say double that's it. You, no, not no. like just under double. If you're getting good guys, like really good higher end. Is there such thing as plaster exterior? Yes. And what do you do when you do that? Oh, lots Are of those columns. Stuff. 
The columns are plaster, yeah. I've actually just picked up a, a form to do a 10-foot column, so I can make 10-foot columns now out of plaster. Square round? Uh, fluted. Fluted? So you know the Greeks and the Romans and stuff, they had the yeah. ones? The, the traditional columns. column? Yeah. You're making that out of what kind of a mix? Plaster, just plaster. Really? Yeah. That there's this new plaster that comes out. It looks just the exact same as Heritage Plaster. It's called, I think, GRC. But I don't know anything about that, so I can't tell you anything about okay. it. Jesamite as well, I think, is another one. It gives you the exact same look and feel, but there's just more additives and acrylics and stuff in it. Are you doing Heritage Homes? And does the Heritage Foundation accept you in with open arms because of what you do? I try to sign up to the, the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals, but... You have to have someone to sponsor you to get in and then you have to have a lot of referrals and stuff. Someone has to sponsor you to get in and then you have to have two people as referrals, but then they have to be members and different stuff like that. So it was too hard to get into. So again, another mafia family. Sounds like <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> I would um, say so. Yeah. You know Plus, what? I, I'm going to get into plaster because you get into into families. No one talks about each other. <laughs> no one brings up anyone's <laughs> names. I like this. There's a lot of respect. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm, not, I'm not one for chasing accolades or joining clubs and stuff i kind of just plaster. but is it not true that 007 was scottish <laughs> no uh, no he went to scotland no he pretends he's british <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you talking about the original one yeah like sean connery yes. there, was somebody, there was somebody before him though a d- dragon no no, no 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 there was something after <laughs> him sean connery sean connery son, was the first one yeah sean connery's son had the uh, he had a holiday home in the village that I grew up in in Scotland. Really? No way. Yeah. That would have been pa- Patrick? I think it was, yeah. I think, I think Patrick his name Connery. was Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Patrick Connery. Yeah. yeah, never seen him. I just Dragon's <laughs> Lair. <laughs> I'm 007. <laughs> you okay. can be the next 007. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No, but we have one thing we almost missed. What's that? It's yeah. green I book I totally talk. forgot about it. It's We have to do a little segment yeah. here. So... Uh, we're trying not to repeat any, so we're not going to. <laughs> we um, or you? Employer failing to ensure training and fall protection. What do you think the fine would be? Nine fifty. Ooh, this guy's a big shooter. <laughs> you, Manny? Five fifty. Of course, it's five fifty <laughs> it's for only first. Five fifty. Five fifty for the first offense. Isn't that sad? First offense. It's That's sad. it. Yeah. If you own a company, guys, make sure you train your guys and make sure they have all their slips at work. And or, that was. That was Green Book talk. Which makes me think, what's the Green Book like in Scotland? Or is there a Green Book there? It's a bottle with gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. Um, I was working on a site in the middle of Edinburgh, like right in the very center, right next to the Scott Monument. It was a, a big new build. And if your feet were six inches off the ground, you had to be in a, an enclosed platform. Six inches off six, the ground? Six inches. You had to be in a, an enclosed platform. I remember having these conversations with, with Barry Hopkins, right? Yeah. We were talking a lot how Yeah, you're platforms. not allowed any cables or anything. On the, the ground has to be completely clear of it. Everything has to be hung from, from up above. It's wow. A lot, it's a lot safer it's there, strict, man. Very strict. If you could tra- change anything about the industry, what would you change? The way that it's schooled or the fact that there is no schooling of it. It seems to me that it's only really plumbers. Schooling is failing in construction. In yeah. my eyes, it is. The, the, the only thing that I see is that plumbers and electricians are really the only ones that's regulated. I get a lot of people telling me there's more than, way to, more than one way to skin a cat. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And I guarantee you there is. But if there's a minimum kind of standard that everybody's got to reach before they can start doing their own stuff, then wouldn't that be way better? Instead of just everybody doing their own thing. And it leads to a lot of like confusion and stuff on sites. Even the, the plumbing and stuff, I've been on different sites and the plumbers have run their, their pipes different ways and all that kind of stuff. And nobody's doing it to this minimum standard. I know plumbers are, are a lot more regulated than other people, but if everybody got taught at least the minimum standard, then they could go on and, and go from there and do things and make it easier for them and stuff. But right now it's kind of just like a free-for-all. You know, people can do whatever they want. And I get people telling me drywall structural and stuff, and I don't buy into that. What? Yeah, I was working for a guy. Who he, was telling you drywall is structural? I was working for a guy, an Italian guy, and he told me, because we, we were always taught to put um, screws every six inches. On drywall? On drywall, which is overkill. So that's what we done. You know, we don't have many cracks or anything. I was doing that. It was when I first came over, and, and he says, what are you doing? He started going off the rails at me. He's like, drywall's technically, if, if you look at some book, I don't know what he was referring to, he's like, drywall's 
referred to structural in the Ontario code or something. I've never heard that. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine that a little bit, piece of paper could make it structural. The only exactly. benefit drywall has is... It's, it's not twisting the wood no, maybe a little no, bit. No, no, no. It's fire return. That's all it is. It's just, yeah. it's a separation before... It extends the, the time for you to get out of the house. Yeah. No, it's not even for that. What's it for? It's, it's to protect the fire department when they come to rescue you so it doesn't collapse on them and they get a chance to save you. Bottom line is that it's not structural. Yeah, the so, bottom line is somebody told him that or he read that somewhere and he actually believed it. And he's believed it. it. So that's what worries me is people, they, there's no formal training or minimum standard that you have to meet before you can get let loose in homes and stuff. Uh, of course, it's different if you're in the union or if you're on commercial sites, but I don't know what the percentage is, but how many residential sites is it? You drive down any street in Toronto, there's people getting their basements ripped out, there's people getting additions done. That comes back to what we're, we're actually trying to accomplish here. We, we bring up building code talk. And we talk about the building codes, but they're all minimum. The, the biggest problems are the builders. They're building at minimum requirement and they're charging large for it. You're not getting your bang for your buck yeah. and people are cutting corners. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of the people are looked down on in the building trade as well. is because people get away with so much shady stuff that every time I've worked on a house, the people have either in the middle of a, a story with a GC that's ripping them off or they've got a, a horror story. Every single house. But there's a flip down. side to all of that stuff. So you've got clients that will gouge you on your trade because they want to save money to purchase an extremely expensive appliance or, car. or other kind of furnishings yeah. or a car or whatever. So there's always 15,000 stories, but I think that the trades are the ones that get shit on at the yeah. end. And then the work's been done. We can't take it back. Legally speaking, you can't walk in there and remove your workmanship that you put in there. So now you're in a pickle, but you haven't been paid. So there's, and then, okay, so you're the bad guy, but then you're saying that the client's a bad guy and everyone's back. And so that's, I agree with you. We all look down for that reason, but it all started with the client saying, my budget was X amount, yeah. but I want X, Y, Z amount yeah. and it doesn't work. So either we start or we stop one or the other. Yeah. But they will find somebody that will agree to do it for X, try to gouge them for Y, and then they'll end up in Z court. Yeah, and it's a shame that people are going through three or four contractors before they learn that. Well, let's figure out, like, let's start educating clients where when you find somebody like here and here, that there's a skilled art to it. If you've got a home like that, like your 140-year-old house, it needs to be treated a certain way. It can't be treated any other way. But what's interesting about what you just said is not anyone can go into my home and fix it. No, no, no. And that's you need a real tradesman, a real, you yeah, know, people need to know what they're doing and you pay a premium for that. Yes. That's why a lot of people, <clears throat> I was working on a job, another, a different job in Concordia and the people were about to get um, their street put as heritage, but they were against it because it's going to cost them a lot more to do repairs and stuff. You know, they've got a slate roof. If that roof leaks, then they have to get repaired with a slate roof. Well, so they, slate they roofs wouldn't... never leak. Yes, no, they do. not if they're done properly. <laughs> no, not unless they fall off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> unless you're doing work on the inside and you start shaking and break it or Mother Nature gets behind it yeah. and all this other stuff. But yeah, so it's a vicious circle. It yeah. is, right? It's hard when there's not a governing body kind of looking over everything. I really wish that the schools would step up because I think that there's a lot of dying trades out there, dying work, skills. And I think that I actually believe in Canada, we're almost at 40 million people. I bet you any money there's a good 0.0001% of population that actually wants to do this for well, a living. Yeah. But let's talk about something you mentioned. You were at what school when you were teaching the Willow plaster Bank. course? Bank. Yeah. You made a great point, and I, I, you know, it stuck in my head. You had a gentleman that was running that school. He had moved on and retired. Today's, uh, you know, world of school, they know that nobody cares anymore. And yeah. and the problem is, is it's not that nobody cares. They're actually teaching not to care. Yeah. If they were to teach in school to care about, you know, historical plaster working or masons and, and things that we're losing that we can't duplicate anymore, we would have a different kind of tradesman. Yeah. Right now it's about teaching them how fast you can get into the industry and butcher and put something together, but not teach them how long and how much quality and how much yeah. proper materials it takes to build something that lasts forever. Yeah. When Carlito was rambling there, it just hit me. I think I remember the song from Ghost. Are you going to sing it? <laughs> was it, uh, you've lost that loving feeling? No, it wasn't that song. That's Top Gun. <laughs> 
What is the song? Wait a from, second. From the, the, the what kind of movies are you watching, man? <laughs> Chick flicks, man. No, Chick no, I, I think. Uh, oh no, that was Roadhouse. What's it? Was it, <laughs> it was it was Bill Medley? It was a Bill Medley tune, wasn't it? The one with the ghost with Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. I, I just remember that clip. I don't actually think I've watched I, that I was movie. Like, What's the song called? It's, it's, uh, I, just, I, just like I don't know. Patrick Swayze was cool back then, but I, I kind of forgot a lot of his stuff. <laughs> okay, so, uh, on that note, we I, do, do, I just okay. know that you never put uh, you just never put Piggy in the corner. No, Maybe. you don't put baby. You, nobody puts baby, baby in, the, in the, corner. the corner. What's wrong with you, man? You don't put baby in the corner. <laughs> Kieran, thank you very much, man. For Honestly, me. hopefully this wasn't too painful for you. But I mean, you really shared a lot of valuable information. And I really hope that guys are listening out there that are interested in being a part of this specific trade. But definitely be passionate about the trades, man. Fingers crossed. So uh, thank you so much. It's at kr underscore plasterer on yeah. instagram you'll check out a lot of his feed and he does his videos he shares his stuff but mind you you need to have a skill to yeah. do this stuff not everybody can do it maybe I, you do have a skill i hope you find an apprentice me too yeah or two yeah <laughs> or two or three <laughs> i like that yeah. no thank you very much thank no, you and carlito i think we gotta get out of here <laughs> <laughs> another great show number 75 we'll see what happens on the next one and stay tuned when we actually share what we're going to be giving away and who's going to get it and why and how easy it's going to be to get it so until then check us out a construction life 416 baby T.O. <laughs> thanks <Kieran. laughs>